This is My Child Will Thrive, and I'm your host, Tara Hunkin, nutritional therapy practitioner, certified GAPS practitioner, restorative wellness practitioner, and mother. I'm thrilled to share with you the latest information, tips, resources, and tools to help you on the path to recovery for your child with ADHD, autism, sensory processing disorder, or learning disabilities. My own experiences with my daughter, combined with as much training as I can get my hands on, research I can dig into, and conferences I can attend, have helped me to develop systems and tools for parents like you who feel overwhelmed trying to help their children. So sit back as I share another great topic to help you on your journey. A quick disclaimer before we get started. My Child Will Thrive is not a substitute for working with a qualified healthcare practitioner. The information provided on this podcast is not intended to diagnose or treat your child. Please consult your healthcare practitioner before implementing any information or treatments that you have learned about on this podcast. There are many gifted, passionate, and knowledgeable practitioners with hundreds if not thousands of hours of study and clinical experience available to help guide you. Part of our goal is to give you the knowledge and tools you need to effectively advocate for your child so that you don't blindly implement each new treatment that comes along. No one knows your child better than you. No one knows your child's history like you do or can better judge what is normal or abnormal for your child. The greatest success in recovery comes from the parent being informed and asking the right questions and making the best decisions for their child in coordination with a team of qualified practitioners in different areas of specialty. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summit. In order to learn more about the summit and to sign up for free, please go to www.mychildwillthrive.com forward slash summit. Hi. Welcome back to the My Child Will Thrive podcast. I'm Tara Hunkin, and I'm excited to bring to you today an interview I did with Julie Matthews for the Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summit in its entirety. I wanted to do this because we discuss a topic that is of great interest to many parents, the specifics around how you may notice that certain foods impact your child's mood and behavior. So we're going to dig into that topic, um, in particular, talk about phenols and salicylates, what they are, why they have the impact sometimes that they do on our children, and what you can do about it. So without further ado, I want you to to present to you the entire interview from the Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summit. If you enjoy this interview and want to hear more from the summit, you can go to mychildwillthrive.com forward slash summit and sign up for free. And um, also, as always, I encourage you to subscribe and rate and review the podcast so that more parents like yourself can find the information they need to help their child thrive. Enjoy the interview. Welcome back, everybody. I want to welcome to the Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summit, Julie Matthews. She's a certified nutrition consultant and has been working in the field of autism and diet for many years. Uh, She can tell you a little bit more about that. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. I'm just really excited to be here. So we're going to dive in today to um, some a topic that's that's important to all parents and also one that's of a great mystery to most of us when we're getting started with our kids. But before we do that, can you just tell us how you got into doing this type of work and working with kids with on the spectrum and with ADHD? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like in a way my story is a little unique in that I don't have a child on the spectrum. I got involved from um, very, very, very early on in my nutrition studies. I met a dad who recovered his children from autism. And when I discovered that you could do something about it, that these children were really sick, they were really suffering, they needed a lot of help. Um, and there wasn't, this was 15 years ago. So there wasn't, wasn't anybody doing it. And he, he said to me, we need people that work with children with autism full time. And I feel like he's my guardian angel because he did die of pancreatic cancer very suddenly a number of years ago. And I used to see him at every conference. And his name was Michael Lang and he, um, used to own brainchild nutritionals. Mm-hmm. And, um, So he had a huge influence on my life. I feel like it was a bit of divine intervention 
Um, and I guess combined with my personality of if somebody is suffering and they're the underdog, I guess I'm the one that's going to help. <laughs> so I feel very passionate about sharing this message for parents because I feel a lot of times their story doesn't get heard very much. And I really like to be able to, um, to be able to be there and to do that and to share this really important topic with people that are looking for answers. Yeah. Well, that, that's great. And I know, I know you've been, it, it is unusual to find someone that's working exclusively um, with this, this type of um, disorder. So that gives you lots of insight on obviously clinically working with these kids. So we're going to tap into that today. And I also know that, and I, I mentioned in your, your intro that you also teach practitioners as well, um, as well as parents um, in a couple of your programs that you've created. Absolutely. I love, I mean, for, since the beginning, obviously I've been working with parents and helping and supporting families. Uh, but I also really love working with practitioners because when I train, whether it's a nutritionist or a doctor or whatever it is, they're going to help hundreds, if not thousands of people. And I've been doing this kind of in my own office, you know, I mean, certainly I've been speaking and other things like that, but I've kind of been gathering this knowledge for a really long time and it feels really nice to take somebody and kind of get them up to speed uh, in very quickly so it's very rewarding oh that's fantastic so what we're going to talk about today is sort of beyond the gluten-free casein-free diet so a lot of parents know about that diet and and how it can be helpful to their child but then, then they sometimes hit a, a, a bit of a block wall and they, they know that they've got to go a bit further, but there's so many different options and we need to know why these, these, um, these different options work or how they work. And, and, and so I think we're going to dive into that today. Um, so if you want to start off by t maybe introducing people who haven't heard about the gluten-free casein-free diet, what that is, and then where you'd go from there. Sure. <clears throat> so the gluten-free casein-free diet is a diet that removes gluten, which is the protein found in wheat and rye and barley and a bunch of very common grains that most people eat multiple times every day. And uh, the protein in dairy, uh, which is casein. And so um, these two foods have a lot of problems. They're very inflammatory. They can create a lot of immune system reactions. They can really irritate the gut. Um, they can... Uh, cause autoimmune type reactions. Um, they are very inflammatory and, 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 and can create opiates. And opiates are those things that you find literally in morphine and heroin. Um, those are opiates and we have opiate receptors where those drugs fit, but the foods, if they're turned into opiates, will fit in those same receptors. So it's, it's, basically like the same compound. So if your child's eating these foods and they're not able to break them down proper, their digestion isn't working, their enzymes aren't sufficient, and their gut is inflamed and allowing proteins through that they shouldn't get through, you have a lot of inflammation, a lot of systemic problems, um, including the potential of creating these opioid compounds, which can make people feel spacey and irritable and all sorts of things. So um, I think, you know, one of the reasons that a lot of people start there is that so many people have a problem with these foods and there it's a fairly simple, straightforward diet to do. Uh, and it provides so much help for people that it's often a, a really good place that people often start when they're looking at various special diets. So where, where do you typically go then after that with the clients that you work with? Because they, they will get to a point where that, that has been helpful, but there's, there's next steps. And I know in your book, um, which I have right here, uh, and I highly recommend to parents uh, to get, it walks you through a whole process of how to go about customizing um, a diet. But, but what, what do you typically do after um, they've, they've introduced the gluten-free casein-free diet to, to take it further. Yeah. Um, so then I would look and see what's still going on. So the nice thing about a stepped approach for dietary intervention is that you can remove foods little by little. You don't overwhelm anybody too much with too many concepts. And then you can see what improves and then you can take it from there. So that's the nice thing about trying the gluten-free casein-free diet. You might find that, um, you know, 70% of their really significant symptoms improve like diarrhea and, um, you know, maybe uh, irritability or um, whatever it might be. And then and that gives you a sense of what is remaining and where do I want to go from here? So what does the diet look like in its current version? And what symptoms does the child have still? And then 
see where you might take it next. Now, the one caveat I would have to say about that is that there is the, um, uh, Dr. Sid Baker has a really wonderful quote, um, uh, the, I think it's called the two tack theory, whereas if you're sitting on two tacks, the removal of one tack does not produce a 50% reduction in your pain and no amount of aspirin is going to help. <laughs> and that's the same thing with two diets. If you are uh, sensitive to two sets of foods and you remove one set of food, you might see, like I said, a really wonderful decrease in symptoms, but you might not see anything until you remove both of them, like the two tacks. So, so you know, I guess it depends on the person and where they are. So in, in terms of not complicating things for too much, if you do a diet strategy and you don't see anything, it doesn't mean you're not on the right track. But um, you sh sometimes you'll remove something and you might need to remove something else before you really see the results you want. So anyway, the stepped approach is nice for people that are new to it. So you're not overwhelmed. You can kind of see what helped. If you take out 47 things all at once and they get a lot better, you have no idea what helped and you don't want to stay in the, on a diet that removes 47 things forever. So the staged approach kind of helps you figure it out as you go. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, let's talk about um, phenols and salicylates because that's usually where parents start to hear. That's the next terminology they start to hear. Why are they those particular types of um, compounds that are in some foods as well as in um, chemicals that are in foods that, that we eat and get exposed to? Why are they so um, troublesome for these kids? Uh, that's a really great question. Actually, this was really first discovered, I would say, in the 70s by Dr. Ben Feingold, where I am here in San Francisco. Um, and he discovered that these phenolic compounds uh, can create hyperactivity among a whole host of other problems like irritability, um, aggression, sleeping problems, all sorts of things. Um, when someone isn't able to biochemically process these substances. And what some of the work of um, Rosemary Waring and others found was that children with autism have a deficiency in a biochemical pathway called sulfation. And sulfation is one of the things that processes these salicylates and phenols and various compounds. Um, and so uh, when uh, actually, it, Rosemary Waring discovered that for people with autism. But, you know, there's a lot of very similar underlying condition, uh, biochemical factors in these various conditions. In fact, when I first started studying, my first paper wasn't on autism. When I met my mentor, it was actually on ADHD. But in the first five minutes, he had two kids that recovered from autism, and he started going to autism, 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 and I was totally hooked. Um, but the point there is that the underlying biochemical imbalances are fairly similar. They're just, you know, different individuals with different severities and, you know, different combination of factors that might cause one person to have one thing and one to have another. So a lot of the principles, if I say autism, um, it's often principles can be very helpful for a variety of different neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so when we look at it, we see that these um, individuals have problems with sulfation. We also know if we do a little biochemistry lesson upstream from that biochemical process, you need methylation and transulfuration to be working. Mm -hmm. And we know, um, based on enormous amounts of work um, with Jill James and others, that methylation and transulfuration do not work very well also in people with these types of neurodevelopmental disorders. So you have this combination of, uh, you know, maybe it's genetic polymorphisms and just an inability for the biochemistry to handle it. Then you add these foods and now you get a reaction that other people don't. In fact, they're very healthy foods, things that are found in berries and grapes and, and um, apples and spices and all sorts of really wonderful almonds, all sorts of really wonderful foods. But if your biochemistry doesn't handle them, instead of being nourishing and providing lots of wonderful antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds, for you, they can be very inflammatory and create a whole host of behavioral and other symptoms. Yeah. And what, what types of symptoms do parents typically see when their child's having a reaction to phenols or salicylates? Yeah. I mean, a few of them that I mentioned are like... Um, um, Ear, like hyperactivity is a big one. So mm -hmm. red cheeks, red ears, and hyperactivity are kind of like the most classic ones. If yeah. I see that, that's like a huge red flag for me. But not everybody gets all of those. Sometimes people will have um, trouble falling asleep at night or really energized at night or very aggressive, irritable. I had one child 
that was incredibly aggressive. Um, he wasn't even on um, a GFC of diet anymore. He was on a specific carbohydrate diet, um, but it had salicylates in it, and he was having aggressive episodes multiple times every single day, and his mom was getting very worried. Well, it turns out that for him, the salicylates were the compounds that made a huge difference. And once she took those out, then the uh, behavior and the aggression completely disappeared. And his mother was very worried about him. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can imagine um, all of the concerns that come with when he gets bigger and stronger, what would happen um, if you don't get that aggression under control. So that shows you how powerful sometimes these foods can be and um, how also how uh, empowering the intervention of diet can be to helping parents have tools to help their kids. Now, typical food sensitivities, you can see a delayed reaction, you know, it can be a longer period of time. How does that differ with um, phenols? Um, if with phenols, it can be either. Usually I see it very quickly. Sometimes it might happen five minutes after they ate it. Sometimes it's while they're still sitting and eating the meal. Sometimes it's within an hour or two afterwards. Sometimes it's the same day. Um, it's, often, it's often more immediate. Um, although some people tend to be the types of that, um, it will build up over some time. So you might not see it right away and you might need a little bit of time if they eat it three or four days in a row, now you see it. But typically the difference is that with sensitivity, sometimes it takes a lot of exposure over time, whereas sometimes with salicylates and phenol, phenolic compounds, it can happen uh, very immediately. Yeah. So let's say uh, parents are seeing those types of um, sensitivities or, or the, you know, it's expressing in their kids. What, what, what's the first step for them? Huh. Okay. So if they're seeing those behaviors show up, yeah. have they identified that it's salicylates and phenols yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are the first steps? Well, that's a really great question. So there's multiple approaches. I mean, firstly, for me, I would look at taking out the offending foods and taking some of the burden off the biochemistry and giving mm -hmm. their body a chance to kind of calm down a bit and maybe build up some of these reserves. Um, we'll, we can talk a little bit later about how we can help improve that ability to process these. But to me, the first step would be removing the foods that are causing the problem and then going from there. Now, that's a simple thing and not such a simple thing depending on to the extent for which you wanna remove these. So there are a few compounds. So um, there's phen phenols um, and then there's other sorts of related types of compounds broken down by similar pathways. So salicylates are a natural type of phenol. Um, they occur in a lots of the things I just mentioned, apples, grapes, berries, spices, cinnamon, um, you know, those types of things. But then there's also other phenolic compounds like phenolic amines. And these are typically more in things like proteins that have been um, uh, processed in some way, uh, fermented, slow cooked, something where it's releasing these types of compounds. And then there's other sort of related but slightly different things. So there's different diets that address them. Mm -hmm. There's the fine gold diet that looks mostly at salicylates. There's the fail safe diet that looks at salicylates, amines, and glutamates. Um, and then there's what I do, which is a combination of all of those different types of things, depending on what the person needs. So I might have seven different strategies for how I want to remove them and how I want to test them back based on the individual person. But um, so people can find that, like you said, in my book, they can find more details on how I might do it. Um, or, you know, practitioner might, you know, look at, you know, training with me and getting all those details. But for people that are new, I don't want to overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say you could start with either a simplified approach, like a fine gold approach, or a more comprehensive approach, like a fail safe approach. Yeah. Um, the benefit to the simplistic approach is it's less overwhelming, there's less foods to remove, and that makes it easier to implement. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge to that is similar to the two-tack theory, which is that if you don't get all the food compounds out, you might not know if this is the right approach. So some people might not see any benefit because the fine gold diet is a reduced list of foods. The fail-safe diet is a much larger list of salicylates that they remove plus the amines and the glutamates. So I'd say that those are two approaches that parents might want to consider. Um, and it all, also for me, when I'm working with a client, it depends on the family and the child. The child is 
super picky eater. Um, and these are some of their favorite foods. I might just remove a few of those foods and pick the shorter list first and then proceed from there and see if I need to make it more restrictive or something else later. Other people that have dabbled around and they're not getting results and they're not seeing what they want and they're kind of real go-getters and they can make it happen because their child's more um, less picky, more compliant, they might go straight for the bigger list and then test back after that. So two different approaches. Yeah. Well, and as you teach, and as we know, the doing it the way that works for your particular child and family is, is the most successful in the end, because if we don't actually apply it, then it doesn't work at all. Um, yeah. So what, when you're, you're talking about uh, the, obviously the two different diets, we'll, we'll put some links below uh, to both the, the Find Gold and the Fail Safe resources. Um, do you find that uh, parents come to you and say, but, but now my child is eating only a few foods? Because they've, they've you know, gotten down to so little that we've pulled out so much. Um, yes. Now that doesn't usually happen so much when, if I'm working with a family, I'm usually guiding them so that as we take out foods, we make sure there are foods to add. So there's things like rutabagas that most people in America really haven't heard of very much. Um, I would encourage putting that in, whereas maybe if a parent was out on their own, they might not realize that. So, um, I don't find that so much when I'm working with a family, but I do see it all the time when people come from outside into my practice and they're eating I've had people eating three things when they came to see me. Um, that is a big problem. Um, the more restrictive you, sometimes you need to be restrictive. And that's really to me the million dollar question. How do you restrict exactly what you need to, but not more than you need to? Mm -hmm. um, because when you restrict more than you need to, you get um, potential nutrient deficiencies. Um, you get uh, a very limited diet and the body is being exposed to the same food proteins over and over and over again, making it more likely that they become sensitive to them, which is why I think some people, they remove things and they feel better. Then they remove more things, they feel better. And then they keep, then they get more reactive to the few things in. So they remove more, they remove more until they have no foods left. So mm -hmm. it is a, a balance to figuring out what do I really need to remove, but how do I not overly restrict things? Yeah. Well, so that sort of leads us into the question of um, how do we fix the, the, our, our, our children's ability to process these foods appropriately so they can add them back in? Exactly. Um, I think that that's a really key point because I find that with a lot of diets, I'm not picking on anyone per se, I think just generally, if we have a diet and has these subscribed rules, then we do these rules and people get better. And we think, great, you know, this is their diet. This is the diet that they need. But we never kind of think about, well, why aren't they tolerating these foods? Is there something about the gut? Is there a pathogen that is depleting the nutrients in that pathway, which is what can happen with phenols? Um, is there... Um, um, some deficiency upstream somewhere in the pathways. Uh, what is going on and how can we adjust it? And so for me, it's looking at how can I improve these pathways? How can I provide nutrients to build up those pathways and the pools of nutrients available? And how can I get rid of anything that is going to be depleting those uh, the nutrients in those pathways like for example the pathogens um, and and you know healing up the gut and all those different types of things uh, and both of those things are important and sometimes when people focus on the diet they don't think about well how can I get off the diet mm -hmm. but then other times people think well I don't need to do the diet at all I'll just work on the pathways and I think that there is some balance again between the two of those I think what I've found most often is that I've needed to do both with mm -hmm. most of my clients, or I found that they've done best when they do both. Um, and then figure out when to adjust the plan as you mm -hmm. go. Yeah. So what, what are the, I mean, obviously we've, we've talked about that, that there are methylation, transulfuration and sulfuration pathways that are impaired. So what can we do to um, support that, those pathways in particular while we're, trying to also then heal the gut? Yeah, well, um, so sulfation is basically taking sulfate and uh, attaching it to various substances and doing all sorts of things from mm -hmm. detoxification to the integrity of the gut to the digestive process getting kicked off to um, all sorts of important neurological um, systems and things. So um, it's very important and it needs sulfur. And so um, 
well, one of the challenges that we find is that sometimes people don't tolerate um, large amounts of oral supplementation with sulfur. Um, there might be a variety of reasons for that. So I tend to find that Epsom salt baths and other ways of uh, improving, improving sulfate will build up that pool and give them more availability to that. Um, there are people that do well with sulfur foods, um, particularly, and, and there are some people that can tolerate the sulfur supplements, but I tend to like the transdermal forms, whether it's a bath or a cream or something, because Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. So that sulfate provides that portion, and then lots of kids are deficient often in magnesium, so that's also a nice kind of add-on as well. So. Um, that's one thing. And then working on all the other parts of the pathways. So um, what else do they need? They need folate and B12 working well. And if they have certain genetic polymorphisms, they might need um, more of these or certain forms of them. Um, and then when we go down into transsulfuration, we need... Um, B6 and zinc and magnesium and all sorts of other things as well. And so really, I think working on nutrient status and then working on the gut and any sort of what we call dysbiosis or pathogens or things are some of the key things that I have found that helps people um, reduce that intolerance that they're having, improve their tolerance. Do you find that, um, that there is a gut healing protocol that you prefer over others. There's a lot of diets out there that talk about addressing that. Um, is there a particular approach that you like to take with your clients? There isn't. And actually, this is why um, um, I, my uh, training arm is called bio-individual nutrition, because what I really discovered in um, my 15 years of doing this is that there is no one approach that works for everybody. Um, and it really requires figuring out what is, what is going on for them. Is it an assault that they had when they were um, born where they got antibiotics during labor and that kicked off the whole cascade? Maybe they got some dysbiosis issue. Is it um, something that happened um, uh, something genetic. Do they have um, some family history of uh, certain intolerances to certain foods? What is it for them? And trying to figure that out. So um, I find that there is no one diet that is the right diet for the gut. And there is no um, one supplement or set of supplements that is the key for everybody. And that's what I think makes it a little sometimes more complicated. Um, but much more effective in the end um, for parents that stick with it, put their you know detective hat on, really try to get to the bottom of what might be going on, get some expertise, maybe some testing, work with some people. Um, you don't need to do that necessarily from the very very beginning. But if you're really you know if you are someone that's been doing this for a little while, that might be a really good thing to do, which is to figure out what's going on for your child. How do you address those very specific needs that they have so that they're able to um, improve and m maybe heal the gut? And um, you know, we didn't talk about when we talked about going beyond GFCF. Um, you know, maybe at some point we can just touch on a host of the half a dozen or a dozen other diets that are out there that actually are all wonderful diets. In fact, that's why I wouldn't say that there's one diet because I found that um, like uh, a specific carbohydrate type diet or GAPS diet works really great for some kids, wonderful for some kids, whereas it doesn't work well for others, but they might really do well with like a low phenol diet, like we said, or mm -hmm. a low oxalate diet. I've had people that have been on a GAPS diet for a couple years and you know, when they went off gas and went to oxalates, that was their thing. So I'm not saying one is better than another. I'm saying that they all, the reason that they become popular is because there's truth to all of them. Mm -hmm. They help a segment of the population with a specific thing they have going on. Then what you have though, is that people that will say, this diet helped my child do this diet. This diet's a diet you have to do. This is the one diet that helps everyone. If you don't do this diet, your child will never heal. Those messages are so disheartening to me because it's just not true. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a, it's a really good point because it is, it is frustrating to parents who, um, get the, the wrong messages. Like they haven't done that diet correctly and that's why yes. it's not working for them. There's a lot of guilt that plays into that and, yes. and they're trying so hard, uh, to follow something so strictly. And, and it also, I think, um, often gets people a little too focused on, on being so strict with certain things. 
it's, there's a fine line between the two things. So you did mention oxalates. Um, can you just, because that, that's something that comes up a lot lately, uh, and I think a lot of people don't understand what oxalates are and why they can be problematic and where they even come from. Yeah, this is, this is a really good one because this one, <clears throat> this diet was something that um, we only ever thought of oxalates for kidney stones for mm -hmm. many decades, really, in the, at least in the world of medical research and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and then m m Susan Owens, just a brilliant researcher, um, who actually taught me pretty much everything I know about sulfation. Um, and I met her because of my mentor, Michael Lang, so it all comes together. Um, she basic, I don't, I would like to say she sort of discovered um, that people with autism were having issues with oxalates. And then she helped get some research done and found out, lo and behold, um, yes, actually, oxalates are, can be quite a significant issue in autism. Um, and so oxalates, like we normally think of for kidney stones, they are very painful, they're very inflammatory, um, and, but, but they don't just happen for people that have kidney stones. In fact, in the study they did on people with autism, they excluded anybody from the study that had anything going on with kidney issues. Mm -hmm. So when they found high levels of oxalate, these were people in, in people that didn't have any current history of anything going on with kidney. So that's really very, uh, I think, fascinating and really helps us to see um, there's something going on here and what is it. So in a Quick nutshell, um, oxalates can uh, do, well, two things. Oxalates can come from the diet or oxalates can get generated inside the cell. And um, if you've got low sulfate, they can get generated, it can get into the cell. Um, if you are deficient in certain nutrients, you can produce it in the cell. Uh, if you have leaky gut, you can leak through the gut into the bloodstream and therefore now be available for getting into the cell. Once it gets into the cell, it can affect mitochondrial function. Mm -hmm. So this is a big deal. And we've known from uh, the work of um, Dr. Fry and Dr. Rosnall that mitochondrial dysfunction is really quite significant and um, common in people with autism. So there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle I feel like are coming together after these, you know, decades of these wonderful researchers doing this research. And so for some people, for whatever, or for any of those reasons I just described, they might have an issue with oxalate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, I do hear lots of rumors about oxalates as well. Like, oh, you don't need to worry about oxalates. You just need to heal the gut. You don't need to worry about oxalates. You just need to deal with yeast. All these kinds of things. Um, I don't think we can simplify it down to, you know, let's just dismiss this whole area and work on something else. Sometimes that might be the key, but um, very often it's more complex than that. Yeah, well, and, and to that end, um, can you talk about some of the symptoms that the kids are, are suffering from if the oxalates tend to be an issue because they can be very uncomfortable? Yes, so oxalates create a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Like, just like they create that intense pain when you're passing a kidney stone, um, they can create a lot of pain in the tissues. So I have a friend who's um, an adult. She's a nutrition colleague of mine. So she doesn't, she's not on the spectrum, but with adults, you can often ask them much more specifically, what does it feel like than you can sometimes with kids. Mm -hmm. And she would have this, um, on the bottoms of her feet, this burning pain like she was stepping on hot coals or shards of glass. Very, very painful. Um, um, other people have uh, shoulder pain, hip pain, you know, um, eye irritation, like feels like the sand in the eyes. And, and so for kids, they might not be able to tell you what's going on, but they might be rubbing their eyes a lot or they may be touching their genitals a lot because it's irritated or something. So with autism or even just kids in general, whether it's ADHD, sometimes they're not able to localize it or explain it, especially if they're a bit on the younger side. So we have to look at clues um, of their behaviors. And mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that also frustrates me is a lot of times we think that, oh, these kids, this is just a, a behavior of autism or of sensory sensitivity or something when it might be a biochemical issue. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think the the more of these um, the, the practitioners you speak to that work with these kids, they are all explaining, and a lot of the speakers in the summit talking about how really the 
autism isn't a behavioral challenge. There's, it's all these underlying medical issues that are causing the behavior because these kids are so uncomfortable. Yes. So, you know, like you said, not removing those foods that might be causing that discomfort, at least temporarily while you fix the underlying issues is, um, is really not comfortable for the kids. And you're going to see their behaviors improve quite substantially when you do that. But going back to, again, um, like you said, it's a two-pronged approach or like Dr. Baker says, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have a conversation with Dr. Baker the other day as well uh, okay. for the summit. And um, yeah, the two-tack, I love that yes. approach. If you, you don't do both, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. He's a brilliant and kind doctor, just amazing. He is spectacular. So I was very fortunate to have a chance to speak with him as well. Um, so what, after you, you do these things, so how, how, what is your approach to, um, to, to, to adding things back in? So let's say someone's gone through the whole um, process of it and they can do it a lot of different ways. And I think when we were talking about, we didn't get into too much how to decide what to take out or, or take in in the detective work. And you were, we can talk a little bit about that um, probably at the end too. I often recommend, um, and I know you do in your book as well, that someone keeps a food um, mood and sleep and journal um, so they can really do that detective work up front. Um, so let's say we've done that, we figured it out, we've taken some stuff out, we're going to add them back in. What's typically the process you recommend? Ah, this is another one of those things that if you, that, that if you follow a diet, one of the ones I mentioned, they will have their own set of reintroduction instructions. But it's so funny you bring this up because just yesterday I was working with somebody and we're going to actually put a whole webinar together on this because it's so important um, to reintroduce them and then how to reintroduce them. Um, there's different ways. Again, I think there are different ways than just, you know, uh, the standard kind of way often, well, I guess there's two, I guess there's two general approaches I think of. Mm -hmm. There's Add a whole ton of everything back and see if you get a major reaction. Uh, see if you see something. The challenge is you might get a major reaction. And you, I don't want the kids I work with having a major meltdown. I mean, that's not fun for anybody. Um, but if you have somebody, that, I mean, it's an effective approach. You can see if you get better when you take them out, if you add them all back in, does it come back? But um, I think there's a subtler, uh, easier approach, which is to add them back um, in a little bit more of a reasonable portion size amounts that might be a little bit um, um, easier to deal with. So, you know, some people add like, you know, like I said, like six of the big ones back all at the same time. Some people add one at a time back. Um, they might go, you know, I'm talk to, we're going to a 4th of July party and they might know my daughter's really going to want strawberries and raspberries and blueberries. So let me just see does she tolerate them at all? Can I give her a couple? Does she tolerate none? And so, you know, I might do more of what I call like a functional approach. Like I want this child to be able to function at this party and eat these foods and have fun time. Mm -hmm. What is her particular threshold? And so, um, that just requires some trial and error, you know? Mm -hmm. So to me, it's starting with small amounts and then seeing, how much you can add, which foods are tolerated, because some foods just won't be tolerated, period. And some you can tolerate a certain amount. And figuring out those things is important. And it's a little tricky because, like we were saying earlier, sometimes it's a buildup. So they might handle uh, four strawberries, but if they have four strawberries four days in a row, now they've got a reaction. Um, so it takes a little bit of time to figure out, you know, where that is. And I think a lot of times people are often looking for like, I do want to be able to go to that party. So maybe I don't need to have four strawberries every day, but I would like to have some on that one day. So, you know, it, you can figure it out. It's not that hard. Um, there's various approaches, lots of different um, strategies on doing that. Yeah. So aside from um, the taking the foods out, gut testing, what would you recommend typically? So if you're looking at the state of what's going on in the gastrointestinal system, of course, there's diagnostic things that you can do, right? And there, uh, most tests that a doctor is going to run is going to be um, looking for a diagnosable condition. Um, and that's great if they find something that can be helpful. Um, you can also go to a gastroenterologist and, you know, some people do do that. So there's definitely a place for all of that. Um, uh, but usually when I'm thinking about, okay, well, how do I figure out, you know, 
how does the average parent kind of get a glimpse into their gut without doing all of those things? Or what if there isn't something like a, you know, uh, sort of understandable diagnosis going on? How do you kind of figure out the state of what's going on in the gut? And so there are what they call functional laboratory tests that a lot of um, doctors do, like a lot of the doctors on your summit do, that are going to be looking more at kind of like not just is there a pathogen causing a specific thing, but how much good bacteria is in the body? How are these different um, markers of health, what do they look like? Are we seeing inflammation? Are we seeing reactions to certain things? Are, um, are we seeing maybe yeast or something else that might not show up on a traditional test? Um, uh, so that's one thing a stool test can often provide is a nice broad picture of what might be going on. Um, also a, um, an organic acid test can look at some things that also sometimes are more difficult to detect. Um, some uh, pathogens don't colonize very well when exposed to the air. So there's various other metabolites people might look for or different things. So those are you know, some ways that parents might be working with their practitioner to get a sense of how the, their child's uh, gastrointestinal system is doing and whether it might be um, something else underlying all of this that they might also want to be working on. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's really helpful to know because there are a lot of testing options out there and um, it gets confusing really, really, really quickly for parents. Yes. So we've, we've talked about obviously how to, how to look for different um, signs and symptoms of, of these, these particular types of foods affecting your child. There are a lot of other diets out there, um, not just the low phenol and the fail safe or the low oxalate. Can you just touch uh, quickly on what the other options are that parents will typically hear of um, above and beyond the gluten free, casein free, and um, and where and how you typically look at those? Yeah, sure. So um, there's a variety of different grain free diets out there today, uh, grain free and starch free diets, uh, things like the specific carbohydrate, the GAPS diet, the gut and psychology syndrome um, book by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. Um, there's the paleo diet. Um, there's low FODMAPs diets, uh, or yeah, I guess different versions of the low FODMAPs. Um, you know, a lot of those are going to address the different types of carbohydrates that are going through the system. And different ones can be a different, can be a problem for different people. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, the SD and GAPS don't really remove all the FODMAPs. The FODMAPs don't remove all of the grains and things. So sometimes a combination of more than one diet can be helpful. Or sometimes, like we said earlier, just really pinpointing that specific right diet um, can be the way to go if it is just a diet. So those can be helpful. Um, what else is there? I mean, there's low histamine diets, which are, you know, again, various uh, versions of what we kind of talked about with the phenols and the amines. Histamine is a type of amine. Um, so that's something uh, boy, there's all sorts of different ones. I'm trying to think there's even more than that. There's, ketogenic diets and low carb diets and autoimmune paleo diets and mm -hmm. you know diets that remove lectins and you know um purines and i mean the list goes on and on but for um and i talk about maybe a dozen different diets in my book um and i probably work with maybe about 15 different diets to some level um but i would say that they're grouped in some major categories which are you know the gluten-free and dairy-free diet um grain-free and starch-free diets, um, and then what I call some of these food chemical types of things, so mm -hmm. food compounds and chemicals like phenols or oxalates or glutamates or, um, you know, those types of things. And um, uh, it's not as complicated as it really sounds. I mean, um, if I were going to look at it, oh, and, oh, you can't forget the body ecology diet, of course. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful diet. Um, and Donna Gates is, you know, an, another very, very intelligent um, uh, practitioner, author, and um, so, and that's going to deal more with yeast and getting lots of good fermented foods in and taking the sugars out, which I think are just wonderful, general, great principles. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say that those are maybe some of them. And then there's all sorts of other things, right? Like there's like low sugar diets, there's vegan diets, there's vegetarian diets, there's, you know, a variety of other things. 
not as much of a fan myself as some of the, particularly like the vegan diets, just because most kids, well, all kids absolutely must have B12 for the neurodevelopment um, or they can have permanent damage. So it's very important. So someone really needs to know how to do that diet well. Um, also protein is very essential for growth and repair. And especially when you're a child and especially when you're repairing, you might need more than somebody else. So it's not that, I don't think anyone diet is, you know, absolutely totally horrible. I mean, there's a diet that works well for everybody out there. Um, but, but I would say that there's some I steer more towards and some I tend to stay away from more. Um, so anyway, that's a broad like brush yeah. of all the different diets. But I would say if I'm going to work with a child with ADHD or autism or, you know, sensory processing or some sort of challenge, I'm going to probably look at gluten-free, casein-free first because pretty much all the other diets remove gluten anyway. Mm -hmm. So you might as well start there. Um, some of the other diets like SCD and GAPS and some of the low FODMAPs, they don't necessarily remove all dairy, just certain forms. So I like to kind of remove all the dairy to get started and then you can kind of figure out from there how to approach it. Um, yeah, I guess I, I guess I would say that those are some of the majors. I don't know if I missed anything that we want to no. talk about further. No, I think, I think you covered them off. But I, what I will say is that, uh, as I know, because you've been doing this for so long, that it doesn't seem complicated to you, but I know it seems very complicated to parents. So with that in mind, how do you find a good practitioner to work with? What sort of questions should parents be asking when they go and speak to a nutritionist for the first time? Great. I, great question. Um, okay. So let me, let me go back to the really briefly, the fact that it's very, that can be complex and complicated. So, um, yes, it does. It, it is, it, it's overwhelming at first. And I try to tell people that it, there is a steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, there's a million things to learn and it can seem overwhelming, but very quickly you get a handle of all of those basics and it's no more difficult to feed your child that diet than another diet. And once you get the hang of it, you can start to figure out which foods and kind of work your way. in. so you don't have to be a master at everything to start with step one. And in fact, I would call step one, none of these things. I would call step one, getting out the artificial additives, the junk, the, um, the pesticides, the GMOs, make a clean diet, something anybody can do without really changing their child's diet much at all. And that I think is very, very important. So if parents are new and they are overwhelmed, small baby step-by-step -step changes, starting with taking out the junk, taking out the artificial stuff, adding in the good stuff, maybe um, little by little or as you can take out the sugar. You know, this doesn't, this is not like the first one to the finish line wins. This is a slow step-by-step -step process over time. So yeah. um, let's just, yeah, let's start with that. Um, and then how does someone find someone to ha get, get help from? Mm -hmm. um, Firstly, I think it's nice to be a little educated because then you know what questions you're asking your practitioner. So if you have a sense of like, wow, you know, I read the book and I'm thinking that, you know, I'm looking at the symptoms and I'm looking at the food list. I think my child might have a problem, but I don't really know. I'm narrowing it down to three, three diets and I don't know how to go to the next step. That's where you might say, you might interview your practitioner and say, I'm thinking about the GAPS diet, the oxalates and phenols, and I'm not totally sure which ones are my issues. Do you work with these? That alone, you will find a wealth of information because there's not that many people out there that work with those diets. Um, there are people now, there are lots of people that understand those terms if you throw them out, which is great. Um, and I would take it a step further to do you work with these? Have you worked with these? Have you had success with these? What do you think about these diets? Because sometimes they'll just come around and tell you, oh, there's no, there's, there's nothing to that, you know? And they might tell you like, okay, well, if I'm wondering if there's something to that and someone says there's nothing to that, maybe that's not my person. Um, so you can get a lot, I think, just by asking a few questions. And if you are at a little bit knowledgeable, it'll really help you kind of figure out what you're looking for. Um, if you're not knowledgeable, um, gosh, I mean, I think that even just in this conversation just now, they'll have, they'll be knowledgeable enough to ask mm -hmm. some questions. Yeah. So hopefully, um, I find a lot of the, uh, you know, good practitioners out there will be happy to either talk to you first or answer a question for you at least. 
So you're not just blindly going into this appointment. Um, you might also find out some data from their intake form. If they don't ask many questions about diet and, you know, or if they're a nutrition professional and they're asking mostly like height and weight and calories and, you know, some of the basics, um, you know, you might want to dig further and find out what, what, what their, sometimes just their beliefs about diet will, and nutrition will tell you a lot about how, what diets they work with and what they'll mm -hmm. do for, you know, what they can help you with. So I would say that. And then, um, that's for looking for a nutrition professional then, and there are lots of different types of nutrition professionals and all of them can be helpful in different ways. So there's registered dietitians and there's nutrition consultants and there's health coaches and, you know, they all have, um, their uh, ways of practicing and um you know getting some referrals from friends might be a really good way to go mm -hmm. um and ask your friend a little bit more so if your friend says um i'm totally into this one diet you need to be seeing my practitioner that diet that practitioner might be into just that one diet so you might want to find out a little more from your friend you know, get some scoop. But referrals, I think, are one of the very best ways um, to get a sense of how some, what else someone's experience was with that person. Because then you also get a sense of their, you know, bedside manner, for lack of a better term, or, you know, their personality and how you drive, jive with them and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've been speaking to practitioners, obviously, over the course of the summit. Um, that, that the, the last point you made there is one that most of them make, which is that the relationship between you and whatever practitioner it is, it, it is so important because you want someone who's really going to listen to you and that you get along with so you can, you can figure this out together. Exactly. And you can be honest with them and you can, um, uh, you can feel free to share some of these important details. You know, you don't want to be afraid to tell them that you haven't, quite done everything 100% because you don't want them yelling at you. You don't, I mean, I don't want that kind of a practitioner myself, right? So you want to kind of, you know, know all of that. And also there's one more thing I was going to say about, oh, choosing a doctor. So your doctor may not be the one that holds your hand through the exact diet you choose and the exact implementation of the diet. But in the same spirit, hopefully your diet will be, or your doctor will be supportive of diet generally speaking, so that you can go to them at minimum and say, I'm doing this diet and they can be supportive mm -hmm. or hopefully speak semi-intelligently about that. Or maybe they'll say, oh, you're doing that diet. That's helpful. That might indicate something about certain biochemistry things. Let's try this test or let's try this supplement. They may not have to be the expert in every single food that's in that category or all that stuff, but some way of bridging the gap is very helpful. Yeah, that, I mean, that is a really good point because I think most parents um, that are at this point know that a lot of physicians and they don't get a lot of nutrition training and especially in specialized diets. So finding one that understands why you're doing something and can be supportive and a bit of a cheerleader too, because I know most of the practitioners and the physicians that I speak to, at least on the summit, are huge um, supporters of diet being one of the first interventions, if not the first intervention. So yes, uh, and that will tell you probably a lot about that doctor and whether you think they might be a fit for you. Exactly. So um, moving forward, since uh, we've had this conversation, where can people find you and um, more about what you do and um, more of the information that you share? Other than obviously, we will make sure we link your book below the talk so that because um, this is written for parents as well as practitioners, so um, it's a it's definitely a must uh, read. What, where else can they find you? Uh, well, if you want to know everything autism, uh, that's on my website, nourishinghope.com. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, you know, just this might be a good time to just say that's, I mean, one of the reasons I named it Nourishing Hope is, you know, I want to impart the message on to parents that are listening that there is always hope and that nourishing your child is going to help you um, continue to I have more hope, right? You have to start with some hope to believe you can change. You start to make some changes. You see some results. You get more hope. You take more action. Um, and all of those things I think are really valuable. And so people can find um, like all of the writing that I do and all of my um, parent uh, learning 
and educational tools and things like that on nourishinghope.com. And then for practitioners, I teach a special practitioner training um, for uh, professionals, and that is at bioindividualnutrition.com. And that's for um, any doctors, nutritionists, anybody that wants to learn how to use all of these different special diets and uh, nutrient support based on the very specific biochemical needs of the individual person. And we have a few, actually not even a few, uh, actually quite a few um, um, uh, parents that decided, you know, the kind of go-getter parents. We oh, Parents kept asking me, well, can we do the training? Can we do the training? And at first I was like, well, it's just for practitioners. And then so many of them asked, I said, okay, yes, you can. So we do have actually a special scholarship for parents that do want to really dive very, very deep into it. Um, and th so those are the two ways to find me, nourishinghelp.com and bioindividualnutrition.com. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you for your time today and um, also for all the work that you do to help support parents, both obviously in your clinic in San Francisco and uh, through uh, Nourishing Hope and the Bioindividual Nutrition Institute. So thanks for your continued work and effort for these kids. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. It's really been a great pleasure. So that's a wrap. Thanks for joining me this week on My Child Will Thrive. I'm so passionate about giving you the tools and information you need to help your child recover. And as they say, it takes a village. So join us in the My Child Will Thrive Village Facebook group, where you can meet like-minded parents and stay up to date on everything we have going on at My Child Will Thrive. This is Tara Hunkin, and I'll catch you on the next podcast or over at mildchildwillthrive.com.